Tom, my very good man, how are you keeping? I'm very well, very well. Thank you very much for asking Gerard. Back with another bonus episode. I tell you, that's right. If somebody was as good to me as we're being to everybody else, I'd fucking marry. Oh, wait, I am married. Um, oh, fantastic woman and all the rest of it. But yes, we're very excited to have it. <laughs> another bonus, another worst gig bonus episode for the Tom and Jerry show. And as you say yourself, yes, indeed, we are being very good to people. Uh, this episode is the second Tom and Jerry episode you get this week after season six, episode one dropped on Monday. And thank you all for your lovely comments on that. But to the matter at hand, Tom, we've got an author in our midst today don't you know I know we're kind of stepping it up aren't we do you know we really are and you know what I've got to tell you a lot of, a lot of the people um, a lot of the people could be looking at this going an author hang on how would they have a worse gig ever Why? would you run out of pens writing boy <laughs> <laughs> to which we say oh no Tom no you, you you don't understand oh no this is a man who who, who uh, not only has a couple of worst gig ever stories to tell us he very possibly had by any metric the worst gig ever in oh, one of the best stories ever told right up to one of the, yeah right uh, along with that i'm sure pe- people could probably tie in something and go well i this is so well told this story this that, is Mm. And 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 it's it's very possible that you might have heard this story before, but you've never heard it told like this from the uh, horse's mouth. You've definitely you, you, you may have read itself. it. You may have read it because it has reached every corner of the planet. This story, but you may not have. I would highly doubt that you've heard it from the horse's mouth. And by Jesus, what a story! Sure, tell you've, everybody. You've, 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 yeah, you've definitely never heard it told with me and Tom laughing our balls off all the way through. <laughs> 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 Ah, Tell everybody who we've got, Jerry. Gentlemen, our guest today is the wonderful Shockproof Beats himself from Twitter, Seamus O'Reilly. And we're delighted to have author and all around raconteur himself, Seamus O'Reilly. Thank you very much for coming on the, the Tom and Jerry Show, Seamus. Thank you so much for having me. It's- I uh, I do think Tom, if I'm right on this now, Seamus is our first Nordy guest, isn't he? Is he? Yes, he. Yeah, technically yes, he, he would be. Yeah, yeah, he would be technically. Yeah, we we got international. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You might notice my accent going all to hell now that I've got some. We had we had Marty Moon on a couple of weeks ago from Monaghan, and honest to God, yes, Bride wasn't sorry. right for a week after <laughs> he was he was drawing silage and how nay, but you know he was it was ridiculous. So. We're in uh, for a treat. Oh, um, my accent's been pretty horribly flattened by years in Dublin. I was just talking about this with someone recently. That I spent seven years in Dublin where no one could understand what I was saying for like the first three months I was there. So I just <laughs> completely flipped to this horrible middle RTE sort of uh, thing. So um, if it does go back and forth, please uh, send flowers and forgiveness. Absolutely not. No, I want to. See, I want to see a bit of darkness coming out where we go back old school or something like that. With shame, it's just let's let's the veil slip every so often. Every so often, as a treat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just they call them Easter eggs in the gaming world. Do you know what I mean? You find. I know them very well. <laughs> <laughs> so, Seamus, you're very welcome along to my worst gig ever here on the Tom and Jerry Show. Uh, uh, wonderful to have you on. Uh, what have you got for us, my good man? My worst gig ever. Um, I mean, it's probably rude to mention the Mary McAleese incident. Um, <laughs> not rude at all, Paul. <laughs> I would absolutely love to hear about the Mary Magdalene. I mean, it's gonna. It's you probably, just, you just... In terms of work, I mean, I've I've played a lot of music gigs and stuff that didn't go great, including one where I was so intoxicated and high on life, shall we say? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that I intermittently forgot what I was doing and thought that I was literally in a completely different place. Which actually, annoyingly, this is gonna it's gonna actually have uh, a cousin. Uh, of a story in the Mary McAleese thing. Um, just in case people think that I'm a complete uh, drug fueled uh, addict or something, these all happened in a very discreet part of my life. Um, but I was very worried about that gig that I played uh, in a tiny Italian restaurant that had been converted into a, a rave nest for the night. <laughs> and uh, I was so worried about it because I, I came to, like, I came to about an hour later, kind of came to kind of like, oh my God, what just happened? And delightfully, I discovered that 
every single person present was also in the exact same sense of inebriation because oh, every that. one of them came up and said, great set, man. I was really good. So <laughs> that, uh, I just want to say, Shams, that's quite the swing from an Italian restaurant to a rave nest. I mean, me and Thomas comedians have shown up every now and then where they're like, yeah, it's a coffee shop, but they're going to try a little comedy in the corner or it's a GA club, but they're going to try comedy in the corner. But never have I seen a swing so hard from like it was G was Gino there, like still, you know, you know, in handing Luigi's out glow sticks. Trattoria, in Luigi's Trattoria on Church Street and stuff. Yes. I think I was, I think I was in London for about two years and I was still plying my trade as a uh, as a producer of mind bending sort of techno and uh, house and stuff. Um, one of the very best, as I'm sure you all know from having bought all my records and listened to them and put my Honestly, on it's in between you it, and Paul Lokenfold. It's just like, where are we? <laughs> ah! I can't. We're, big, I... We're, we're the big two. I'm sick of being compared <laughs> to him. Um, so that was just one of those things. Uh, this will not shock you, but around about 2011, 2012, 2013, there was a lot of people that I'd known from my Dublin days who all of a sudden were working crappy jobs, but working in London. So there was this roaming pack of sort of Dubliners and people who had known from Dublin who were now living and people were putting on gigs. And we were literally transplanting the same house and techno nights that were happening in Dublin when I was there two years later to London because there was more of us there than there was back home, so to speak. So uh, Luigi's Trattoria was one such place. Um, I believe it was a gig for St. Patrick's Day. So it was... (laughs) In an Italian (laughs) restaurant. Okay, yeah. (laughs) So it was was just rustic sod botherers, the sons and daughters of Ireland, rank and file. I don't know if... I don't know if any English people darkened the door or were allowed in. Um, certainly there might have been more Italians there. Uh, sort of, <laughs> I, think, I think there was a woman who cut, there was a girl who was in very high heels and who'd cut her leg or something and there was blood on the floor. So it was all very CBGBs kind of, uh, one of those romantic <laughs> things, which is not really romantic, even out of remove, but gains some measure of romance as you get further and further away from your twenties and realize just how horrible these things were. Um, but yes, yeah, so that was one that, uh, that was like, you know, one of those things where like you drop a sweet in your kid or an adult and you've got the five second rule. You yeah. Know, you just, you get that little gift from God. Um, I think that was my uh, one, one go at that where I had completely messed up everything that I was supposed to be doing. But luckily every single witness in the building would probably be classed legally as extremely unreliable. Um, how, how far off the tracks did you go? We'll say to the point that, you actually realized later well, i was playing your... a live set which is to say i was playing my own music and at one point i was playing other tunes by other people um turning the volume up and down kind of randomly as if i was at a space console <laughs> <laughs> essentially was... if myself and my bride were allowed behind the dj desk that's yeah, what we, yeah it okay. was it was it was one of those nights and um yeah as i said um I, even afterwards i was like kind of doing that thing you do where you kind of address the thing so that other people don't mention mm. and people either looked at me mystified like no that, that was that was that was fine man that was fine um and i was like oh they're just being nice and then i realized that they said the same thing about all the people that came after us including themselves who'd been just as ropey and bad so i'd say if there was a single sober person in the house it would have been one of the most bewildering uh <laughs> spectacles ever put on but look, luckily there wasn't so everyone had a great time and i managed to get away i i, I love the notion that there was one english per- person snuck in with yeah. a stereotypical notion of what irish people were like and walked in and saw that madness yeah. fucking unfolding everywhere just going oh right i kind of i kind of get that sort of push pull with things because i mean we're seeing now all those amazing scenes with uh kelly harrington and the the lad from mooncoin and kilkenny who brought a pack of spuds and it's like, it's really funny because I love that. And I think it's amazing. And it's Ireland at its best. Like it, it would have me, you know, clutching the flag to my breast. But then the, if the Americans and the English are a bit too fond of it, I kind of feel like I'm going to say, well, we're not all like this. And it's like, well, yeah. you can't have it both ways. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes stereotypes yeah. are actually just a real time saver. So um, we have to, kind of maybe, <laughs> we have to maybe appreciate that in real time and realize if we're willing, in fact, delighted to watch a Kilkenny hurling fan hand a literal pack of spuds uh, to the Harrington family, I think I think we can allow for any English person that witnessed the debauchery, the Gaelic debauchery that they saw that night in Luigi's Trattoria. Then, um, yeah, I think, I think you have to have the rough with the smooth there. Yeah, I could see 800 years in their head going, yeah, I think they would probably best 
it was probably a good job. Probably a good yeah, job over there. I'm just I'm just picturing this one person that wanders into Luigi Straporia as having a monocle. I'm sorry, that's oh yeah, this is my rest, <laughs> top it's my resting gear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, he was he was actually a beef eater. <laughs> the top hat was on top of the big furry hat which i thought was overkill and also the clearance and the doors presented a problem um which might have been how that he knocked that girl over and then she cut her leg spreading blood everywhere so maybe we should blame him actually why are we giving him a free ride it was all his fault absolutely um, um, I mean, uh, uh, not knowing not knowing uh your your um your entire body of work there seamus uh what i've listened to i've liked uh i'm seeing you slipping into some st patrick's day habits in your set, if you were saying you're playing songs from other people, did you manage to slip in a dance remix of I'll Tell Me Ma when I go home? Yeah, no, uh, that was, I would say that would be broadly at odds with uh, the musical choice of the night. Um, it was, I think it was, it was a, f- a track a friend had sent me, which is real, that's a real no no, but like just because I was completely belubas. Um, and I think maybe some like Jamie XX or something. So it was, it was actually, not only was it uh, on the one hand with the friends track, uh, a betrayal of trust um on the other hand with jimmy xx was a bit it was a bit of a obvious choice as well so it was it fell below my editorial standards i can't uh, believe it man i can't believe you out of my new uh, before it even hits the shelves to all the folks at the luigi's trattoria luckily he was there and he did not notice as (laughs) previously stated that was a it was a freebie i got an absolute freebie and i did not deserve it but i got it so yeah you didn't you didn't play that track seamus you sampled it that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. I sampled it with just me going uh, uh, over the top of it, effectively. If anyone had been close enough to the console to hear me, just just very confused, like a chimp in a space rocket. Absolutely. <laughs> just lost. Absolutely lost. And worse, my wife, my, my now wife, then girlfriend's uh, cousin was there. And uh, he got to see, yeah, he got to see uh, the, the real side of all of us, all of these friends. <laughs> He'd been invited to he was a sort of a he was a he was an interloper perhaps um but he yeah he got a very very quick education into the sort of stuff that we were up to so yeah i don't know if he came to another one but there we go ah oh, well My, might i say seamus now with this story and indeed the mary mccalee story which is where i where i first uh fell across you on twitter and uh i remember distinctly reading that story going home on the bus beg your pardon on the train and i'm laughing my balls off and as Gabe beside me, he's also laughing his balls off. And I look into his phone screen to see what he's reading. And true enough, it's the same damn thing I'm reading. Just as perfect stranger beside me on the train. Uh, both that story and your Italian rave story seem to have one thing in common, which is they're both the most absolute nightmare fuel scenarios. And yet you skate scot-free out of them. Uh... Yeah, and they both involve ketamine. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and the, the worst thing is, I mean, we, we will get to the meat of the story, which I'm sure some people listening will not actually know. Uh, but I will say that off the back of telling the Mary McAleese story, um, I did hear an awful lot of that from people who had been reading it and then discovered the person next to them on a train or yeah. a bus also reading. It. So it kind of went completely insane. So, you know, the, there's that old joke that, you know, every day there's a main character on Twitter and the basic challenge is to not be it. Uh, yeah. So, yes, yeah, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I, I became the main character of Twitter for a day. Um, so I think to date that that's, that thread has got something like 80 million views. Or yeah, it's insane. Um, which is kind of aided by the fact that there's 40 parts of it. So, you know, I was really taking loads of bites of the chair. Um, but for those who don't know, it basically concerns uh, a workplace mishap. I'll call that a gig in this gig yeah. economy. Yeah, right out of shadow over there. I was basically, uh, I used to work for uh, in a music venue, which I've never named and will not today, um, where basically I had a Friday off. So I thought... And because it was a Friday off, I was relaxing with a friend on Dame Street where he lived. Um, back in the days when I was 18, when people could actually live on Dame Street in, on, as students. And uh, I was very green. I was quite a sheltered kid growing up. I was very studious and bookish and uh, was just really into music and books and everything else. And then in college it was the first time I would have really, really properly gotten into sort of sessioning as they say or going out and all that kind of stuff i drank a little bit like as a teenager but not really very much never smoked a cigarette even and uh i made up for lost time and uh that day was the first time i'd ever ever encountered or seen 
ketamine, which, as I mentioned in the thread, is very often referred to as a horse tranquilizer, but is more accurately a cat tranquilizer because it, it's a wholesale anesthetic, which is actually used on humans uh, as well and could perhaps be very good in the treatment of PTSD and depression and stuff. There's a lot of good stuff about it. Um, I do not work as a ketamine advocate. <laughs> you sounded pretty good there. <laughs> yeah, but the thing about ketamine is it's uh, it's it has a very, very strong effect, but it's not immediate. Uh, this I did not know. So I had a little bit. And I said, oh, this is great. Got my Friday off. This new, cool, fancy Dublin drug. Look at me. Uh, the ketamine was also green, by the way, uh, which I took to be an enterprising, uh, an enterprising flourish uh, by the vet who had made it for a St. Patrick's Day promotion. My God, they're both St. Patrick's Day as well. I never really that. My God. It's, it's, it's terrible. I'm repeating myself just in the, chronology. The Venn diagram of these stories is one circle. It's just like, it's just like that is my full moon of the werewolf is the yeah. St. Patrick's Day. It's just the ketamine day. Anyway, so I'm having a great time with my friend. We've had a few beers. I've had this new special, uh, very uh, adult Dublin exotic drug. And then I get a phone call and uh, nothing's kicked in yet. Cause as I said, it takes a little while and it's my boss. And she says, right, when you come in tonight, I just need you. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm off tonight. Remember we said, and she says, no, no, no. Do you remember you wear off, but then you agreed you get Saturday off and you get a full day's pay to be in tonight for like just two hours. And I was like, yes, I do remember that you said that, but I literally, you were saying it to me as I, was walking out the door like zipping up my top and just getting out of work so i would never have remembered you telling me anything at that point so i'm like okay yep sorry 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 so i'm like okay right i'd almost forgotten what i was doing but i was like okay two hours i can be back and like you know kind of things will still be going it'll be like it was this was like seven so i'll be back by like nine and sure things haven't even right. be great so as i'm going there i'm, I'm walking from Dame Street to the unnamed venue, probably about a half hour walk. I like to walk places if I can. And I'm we'll, we'll stick that on Google Maps and narrow it down. Yeah. I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting that <laughs> thing, those rushes and stuff. And then I'm like, oh right, okay. Something's oh my okay. Oh my, oh god. Uh so I my brain just starts crumbling. Uh, if anyone has ever partaken in that particular substance, you'll know that it has extremely sort of uh reality warping effects you start to see things kind of uh, moving and you fan your fingers in front of your face and you'll see you know 25 fingers following after them <laughs> time <laughs> face, uh, sound light all starts to act differently i mean it's it's uh marvelously entertaining in the right context but this was probably the least nice context imaginable strong so, to work yeah by the time i'm also sweating buckets now probably part of it because i'm anxious and partly because as you know, I'm, I'm a sweaty guy. So <laughs> I go up to the door, I'm there, and I am, I'm Belubis. And obviously you're very self-conscious, you know, in those circumstances, because you think, oh, everybody knows exactly how high you are and you're immediately going to get in trouble. That's like the other thing that comes with any of these things often, for me anyway, is uh, social anxiety about the fact that you're so high and uh, everyone knows. And, <laughs> and I walk in, I'm sweating buckets, and she's like, oh God, did you run here? Um, she's obviously too wrapped up in her own work as is normal and she just thinks that i've just jolted because i've as i made clear to her and it was all fine that i'd forgotten but i'm here now and it's all good so she's like right the first thing you need to know is uh that the president is going to be here and you can be and i was like sorry sorry what says, yeah the, the president <laughs> mary mcaleese is in to see this season's uh sequence of events so it's that thing that you could probably imagine which is the head of the venue uh, which is a very austere venue that has a lot of very big sort of things on. It, it takes the present round for the season of events and shows them the program and says, and this is a Latvian choir and these are these African drummers who come from Ghana and whatever. It's, you know, 20 minutes, but there'll be a person in the corner, me, standing with a tray of drinks. And my job is basically every five minutes or so, come over and do that thing <laughs> with the weddings and say, um, would, you, would you like something? You know, one of those that obsequious little worm that they make you be in those jobs. Yeah. You're barely even pronouncing words because if to, that would be too close to having a conversation with them. Yeah. You just utter some sort of guttural acknowledgement that this is your role. You are a drinks dispenser from like a Japanese RPG. <laughs> a non, a non-playable character selling potions, right? 
So, even even if, even if you weren't off your nuts now, I tell you, this would be a pin the whole of a nation. Oh yeah, and I had done these kinds of things. I'd never done it with uh, with Her Majesty, but I had done it with... <laughs> I'm not here on the nomenclature. I'm not from this place. Um, so anyway, I basically went uh, went in, went into the room, and there's like probably I've got to imagine there was like a two or three minute gap, you know, between me getting in there and you know standing, checking myself, do I smell all that. And then when they walk in, and bear in mind, this is my boss's 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 boss that's showing the president of Ireland around. So it's not just the president. It's a person who could literally get me fired with like a thought, you know, they wouldn't even have to send a text. It would just be, an, it would just occur to them and I'd be fired. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm left in there in this room, which is just set up with loads of the pictures of things that are going to be on. And I'm standing there and I've got the tray of drinks and I'm like, okay, and I'm, my brain just completely gives up. My brain is just saying, well, you're on your own now. There's no stimulus. There's no, uh, there's no traffic. There's no one to talk to. There's nothing. Did you just unravel now. So my brain just basically decompiled. You know, it, like, it was like fragmenting a hard drive, right? It just went everywhere. So I was literally seeing, you know, the birth of the universe. I was thinking <laughs> thoughts that had thoughts of their own. I... I think in the in the thread I describe, you know, my chest feeling like a cathedral filled with bees. My mouth was folding itself in half. You know, convinced that my fingernails owed me money. All these kinds of things. <laughs> just, just a, a horrible honeycomb of. Is she, is she in the room honeycomb. at this stage? Is she in the room she at this stage? No, she's not in the room yet. This is just oh, me even. having just every strand of my being pulled at by reality, right? So then they walk in and uh, for whatever reason, I think, you know, I, I think do something. The worst thing you could do is just, just stand there and say nothing. That'd be, that'd be, that'd be weird. That'd be weird. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I decided I'll say, I'll just, I'll say hello. I'll welcome them into this room, which is of course my home. And I will say, it would be rude for me not to say hello. So for some reason I blurted out, hello guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> In the in the thread, this is uh, accompanied with a tiny crushed baby doll head, uh, which is basically what my brain was kind of positioning myself as at the time. And so, I, um, I uh, thankfully they don't hear this, or if they do, they're too polite to acknowledge it or anything. Uh, it's quite a big room, so maybe they just didn't notice, or they just don't listen to the little potion seller in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> And they begin having these this interminable chat, which I can just about hear. And it's like, it's a laughing choir, it's a and drummers, blah, blah, blah. And she's been very nice. She probably does like 12 of these a day. And um, I'm sure uh, Michael Lee Higgins, that's that's what Monday to Friday is just booked up in a schedule of doing stuff like this. Right. And uh, <laughs> I am just kind of spacing on like, that's, she's very, Macleese is very famous. That guy could probably have me sacked. Uh, just, he probably had me killed. He could, he could me for sport in that, you know, in one of those places in Vietnam, which, you know, I like to imagine Richard Branson just hunts down <laughs> human beings. Oh, yeah. Um, allegedly. I'll just add that for legal reasons. So I'm doing this for a little while. I'm having... I'm actually having, at one point I have the only out of body experience that I've ever had in my life. Uh, which, because, you know, you hear about those things and people describe them and you're like, huh, I wonder what that would feel like. Well, I know what that would feel like because I conceived that I could see the back of my head and everything. So I was kind of like in the wall space of the building. So like, I'm, <laughs> I am no longer mildly high. I am flamboyantly deranged. <laughs> and then I realized, shit, I haven't fucking offered these guys any drinks. Okay. So I'm like, all right, let's go. So I basically move so quickly that all the, there's a, there's a rum and Coke, funnily enough, actually that's the one that really makes me laugh. There's like a white wine, red wine or whatever. So like, you know, something for all the family. I think the idea probably traditionally was that they'd have to like drink all of them, like chug in a sort of, <laughs> <laughs> just as a real test and the 12 of these a day you know they'd get through it it's, uh, it's the whole luminati thing you have to it's exactly you know, yeah. yeah i mean some of it was children's blood you know um yeah. but I, I i i i presume obviously the idea is you don't have to ask if you want a white wine there's one there if you want a red wine if you want a rum and coke which would be very very strange for me if i could <laughs> used to pick that i'd love that but like you know i i live in i live in hope that one day she did anyway 
I move so quickly that they judder, all the glasses judder. So I'm like, oh God, I'm going to stop the drinks. I made so much noise, in fact, that like I could see them turn towards me like, oh my God, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> Noticing me for the first time. So as I put it in the thread, I say, slow down there, Martina Hingis. Just take this easy. <laughs> take this easy. So I start moving, but by the, I'm still like 10 feet away from them, having moved like half a foot with that one initial judder, <laughs> that noisy judder that's kind of basically taken 10 years off my life. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to die in like four weeks, basically, um, just because of that one thing I did. So I start moving slower to offset this because that's what happens. You get, you, if you've moved too fast once, you have to move really slow for a little bit further afterwards until it evens out. Enough, yeah. The problem with that is that I'm now moving at like, half speed <laughs> room. so slowly that my legs are cramping uh, i can see them looking at me by the way the entire time and they can see this very sweaty strange young man uh who is moving advancing towards them <laughs> like, like he's a lion on the savannah <laughs> trying to catch them out. so slowly until they can see the whites of my eyes anyway they're they're looking at me like you know in you know, in the crystal maze, whenever you've got people outside shouting and screaming at someone trying to get across a plank, yeah. they're like willing me to do it, but also annoyed at me. I can think, I, I think I'm intuitive. Um, come on, come on, grab the crystal. It's in the skull. It's in the skull. Um, which they didn't actually say because it wouldn't have made any sense. So <laughs> trying to get to them, I offer them the drinks. They say no, which is to be expected because I was probably doing this roughly 45 seconds after they walked into the room and I was interrupting them to do so. So I go back to my bed and I'm like, okay, that was all right. It's fine. So I'm back in my corner, still kind of extremely spacey and getting worse uh, because it is, by the way, not even 25 minutes since I got the phone call and therefore, you know, had just, just, just. Oh, you're on the cusp. Uh, yeah. So like oh. if you were sitting in a session, you just had that, it would, it would still be the early days, you know, but I just oh, yeah. had with yeah. the, the eighth president of Ireland and this aforementioned man who hunts humans for sport. So I do this once or twice more. I think the steadily sobering up, even just from sheer act of will, rather than, you know, probably chemically. Um, and probably from the, the, the adrenaline that's pumping through me, I'm kind of like sobering up slightly. Cool. Um, I'm leaving bigger gaps between when I go and see them. I'm walking normally. So, you know, tick, tick, tick. You know, everything's coming up, Seamus. And then finally, at the end of this fairly brief uh, evening, um, Mary McAleese does take a drink and so does my boss's 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 boss and uh, she's very nice uh, she's uh, she's Charlie she's talking to me she says oh is that a northern accent I detect and of course I'm like oh wow I mean I love Mary McAleese everyone knows Mary McAleese and being from Belfast as uh, she is and being de from Derry uh, my mom actually was in university at the same time as her so it was all these things I could have said in any normal environment and kind of been a charming, <laughs> charming student but instead, when she said, and how are you liking Dublin? Do you think it's... And I said, I like it. I think it's good. Just completely. <laughs> she hadn't even finished the sentence. She was obviously going to say, oh, how are you finding Dublin? Is it nice? And uh, I was like, I like it. I think it's good. Um, <laughs> the, the sort of top dog, the the chief, the, the boss's 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 boss, actually recalls it. And I think he said, Jesus. <laughs> um... um but the, he, he flinches for half a second. She flinches for half a second, and then she's just like, "Oh, well, yeah, that's lovely." And it's you know, just gives me this whole very, very nice, perfectly measured, and it doesn't seem at all rehearsed. Seems very genuine. Just a nice little minute or two sound bite about you know trying new experiences and you know everything else. She, I mean, she's just lovely, you know. And uh, by new experiences, I know she means green ketamine, by the way. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, on that also tick <laughs> so, <laughs> that all ends as we're walking out the boss man i'm positive he gives me a look like what who are you and what has happened but like says nothing and then walks out you know kind of very not quite stern but just confused and possibly <laughs> angry but like i cannot be a good judge of any sense of reality here at all but so i can go back into the little change room we have after I think it was like 25 minutes worth of actual work, you know, so, and it felt like it take, it was like geological eras. Had <laughs> so I'm back in there and I'm sweating and I'm just like, well, I'm going to get sacked obviously, but 
I didn't make an absolute fool of myself. I didn't pass out or like spill something on someone or like scream something obscene. And uh, my boss, as in my sort of low level boss, who I call Dimpna in the thread. So Dimpna, she comes in and she's like, okay, Seamus, you could have told me you'd be like this. So I'm like, okay, well, she's a younger you know, woman and she's kind of in Dublin. She knows the crack. She knows service people can sometimes, you know, have a little bit of uh, something cheerful every once in a while. Yeah. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just about to answer on that scale. And she says, I had no idea you were such a fan of Mary McAleese. <laughs> 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 and apparently, apparently the boss man, he had indeed related the events of what had happened, but what he had seen was someone who was so starstruck, so bewilderingly enamored of Mary McAleese that he I, he couldn't get together. And what she was asking was, why didn't you tell me that you were like her biggest fan so much so that you sweat oh, and uh, can't walk properly and introduce yourself <laughs> to the room in which she's just walked in as if it's your own house. Um, so that saved my bacon because because I, you know, look quite nerdy and bookish and especially because I was always, um, I, I always kind of, I didn't really meet the sort of existing stereotype of someone who'd just been taking cat tranquilizers for kicks. Um, and my nerdy affect had finally kind of done me a real good solid. So all those wow. years, of, all those years of not being um, necessarily the most uh, sexually explosive um human in, in the world to the girls that I was courting had finally come back to kind of reward me because faced with that face those sweat glands and my general strange behavior they were forced to conclude that I was simply a diehard fan with the <laughs> scarf and the rattle of anything of <laughs> Ireland's eighth president and the original MMA Mary <laughs> I love oh it. My God. Had it been anybody lesser, you know what I mean, that you didn't know who they were or whatever, do you know, if it was just a, some corporate guy that was being shown around yeah. and you still behave the same way, there's no, like, yeah. o- other than going, wow, I didn't realise Seamus was such a big fan of, of Jerry O'Brien. I, who would have known he was into <laughs> insulation? Who knew? And the weird thing is, as well, people have actually also said that, and a lot of people, when they read the thread now, because it's, it, this happened when I was 18, um, and so people will read the thread and they won't kind of they'll read one bit of it or whatever, or they'll read it and they'll mm-hmm. misremember it. And so they'll think it was about Michael D Higgins. And I'm like, I would be exactly the same in that situation with Michael D Higgins. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be the same in that situation probably with Mary Robinson. Like, it seems like they've had a pretty good run of people who are famous in that sort of like banknote famous, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, like I've had to, I've had to deal with an interview uh, like for the Irish Times or the Observer, like loads of people who I really respect. But, there is something different about those people who are, like I said, they look like they're printed on official paper. Yeah. Um, and especially because a lot of Americans, because it was when particularly massive on American Twitter on that one day that I became the protagonist of Twitter. Um, because they, they were trying to, they were kind of like imagining what it would be like, you know, with Obama or Trump. And it's like, it's yeah. not perfect. It's not a perfect mm. allegory because Irish people don't particularly like their politicians. I mean, almost any of them, but they kind of always give the president's job to people that, at least rightly or wrongly, everyone seems to have a soft spot for. It's kind yeah, of like a mascot. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of there's a mm. cuddliness to them. I mean, I think Michael D. Higgins is probably the this this sort of the high exalted example of that. Um, and it's not really the same if 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 it was I don't know Obama or let alone someone like I don't know Boris Billy Johnson. I don't think it would have been, I probably would have deliberately done it. I'd say in those concepts. Um, but yeah, it's a story that's followed me around i've been telling it obviously for years because it's a good story um and then someone on twitter had said something like what's the worst day in work you ever had um which is an idea you guys should really pick up on um (laughs) yeah yeah, i replied to it with the start the start of the story i was in a job that i hated um in london like everybody else in london uh just literally putting numbers into spreadsheets all day for like a recruitment company it's super super boring and uh I was just answering the question, answering it as in real time. So loads of people had thought that I'd had asked if I'd like right. adapted it from something I've written before or whatever. I was like, no, I've just told this story so many times, but I was like adding lots of extra descriptions and, and thinking about ways in which I could a put across the story in a way that'd be funny. And at the time it was 140 characters. 
and also just ways that I could prolong having to go back to the work that I was actually doing. And the weird paradox of this is that I got away with that at work. And I also got loads of work from telling the story, what, 15, yeah. 16 years later. And um, in the process of telling that, I was being massively, massively derelict in my existing work. So it, the entire thing should just basically have been, do not ever hire this person. Uh, <laughs> because he takes drugs. And by the way, if he gets in your office, he'll just write, you know, for two hours straight about a stream of consciousness about taking ketamine at work. Um, no, on your of, time lo loads of stuff came from it. loads of work stuff loads of uh, writing gigs and I did have some less uh, opportune kind of offers a stag do I think was going to happen somewhere I think in Edinburgh and people were inviting uh, the stag I didn't know these people the stag was inviting me to be there almost like to perform the this whole thing like but I was literally with with ketamine and stuff and I was like um no thank you uh, I tried to look for it the look, other day, uh, but I think he's deleted his account. It's possibly look at look at me and Tom over here going like, who books that? Yeah. Now I wonder if I would do it because at the very least, the I'd, gig on. I'd, write, I'd write a piece about it. Yeah. Let's take um, your shirt off and become Bert Kreischer for fuck's sake. I mean, he's one story from being in, in Russia and there was not nothing as interesting as ketamine and the president. And it's funny with Bert Kreischer's stories, like it's such a good story. But have you ever heard that Good Ones podcast where he talks about all the things that he changed to it and everything else? Yeah. And it's really amazing because it is the difference between a good story and a story which which reads good. That's yeah. me as a professional writer. And it is very, very true. You know, those people who can tell an amazing story, but if you were to get them to write it down or worse still to get them on stage, clams up immediately. Yeah. And I think I was very conscious at that time about how you could use the strengths of a medium and the, the drip, drip, drip of each of the the tweets, trying to make it kind of, trying to put it across because I really like the story and it's still, it's still the thing that follows me around. And I'm just delighted that it's that because there's loads of things I've tweeted which seemed funny at the time, but weren't so much. Or things that were angry, like obviously around Brexit and stuff, being a Northern Irish person and growing up on the border. Yeah. I had lots of very angry threads and I read them back now and you know, I still agree with the sentiment, but I wince a bit because it's very sincere or maybe it doesn't come off quite the same, but that, um, the Mary McAleese threads, I reread it, read it recently. And I was like, I still stand by this. This is great. So that's <laughs> <gonna be." laughs> and, and also, tip of the cap another, to me. Yeah. Yeah. There's an also th another thing. Yeah. Absolute tip of the cap, uh, to myself. The other thing is I got by hook or by crook. I got the observer gig off the back of it, which is quite amazing that they were like, Hey, that guy that with the ketamine thread, would you write a parenting home for us? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just before my son was born so uh, I had that stuff on my mind I've been tweeting other things about my dad and stuff and they were like oh we really like this stuff and clearly you can fashion him fashion a narrative so to speak so they got to that the interest in the book uh, which had already been kind of muted at one publisher all of a sudden that kind of came from that really if I'm being completely honest I already had a column at, with the Irish Times at this stage by the way so I wasn't as obscure as some people think but I absolutely did get a huge jump from this one story and the thing that's good about that is if you can trace something all these positive things to something that is so stupid uh, not just in its content its form and I, I definitely think it's a well-told story and all that blah 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 but it was just a complete lightning bolt that that person put up what's well, the worst every day and that I answered it and that I wasn't just called into a meeting so it couldn't be completed or that I had the wherewithal or the brain power or that I had my laptop open at that exact moment you know a million variables that led to it being seen by you know whatever 80 million and people. your buddy had ketamine that day green ket that day Absolutely. And, they and, and the ketamine did not hit you so hard that you did not remember the fact that Mary McAleese was in the room the next day, which is yeah. always get me. I'm like, well, God, that's some recall for us. There's, well, there's an amazing uh, sort of side thing to that, which is loads of people on Twitter, all now since deleted, who were like, oh, I remember that ketamine. It was green. And oh, I was, uh, yeah, that was it. And people were corroborating my story. People that I worked with. <laughs> uh, in, oh, do you remember venue. when the green case was around Dublin? Yeah, but yeah. People who I work with in that job. Uh, and subsequently, Mary McAleese is like this. <laughs> well, I, have, I have on good authority that she was shown it a lot that weekend. <laughs> um, I've heard from various relatives, and uh, I'm sure you know it's going to happen. But the difference is, of course, you know, her career is not defined by some agent who went viral about three years ago. You know, she probably got loads of 
messages about it for about two or three days and then she just went on to being you know the dignified stateswoman that she is and doing visiting fellowships at prestigious universities and i don't think it really factored too much in her daily life I even bet, she was i being bet it did I wouldn't yeah, understand. I, 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 I did. I did put in several requests to interview her when her memoir came out last year, expressly with the intent of maybe making it clear. But then I, I wonder if I would have welched out of it because I like because if she told me that she if she told me that she disapproved, she thought it was you know I don't know if I thought it'd be like I'd oh, have crush you. It would crush me because also and also like just me personally, but also I wouldn't want to if she told me I was just been sent that I've been tortured with that for, for you know forever. That would really make me feel bad because I don't want her to be bothered with this bloody story. And I didn't think, you know, so many people were going to see it. Um, it's also one of those things that um, it's now been seen by loads of people who I just didn't really want to see that story. So not just prospective employers who subsequently did employ me, so more for them. But like, you know, my my dad, my, <laughs> my in-laws. Oh, no. It's mentioned in the, it's mentioned in like emotional copy not in the book itself, but like around the book, like it's mentioned on loads of the yeah, radio shows. The cat guy. Yeah. yeah. Now my next guest, you might know, was being a drinks dispenser to Mary McAleese, but he's written a book about how sad it is when mummies die. Uh, <laughs> so I'd say, I'd say Mary McAleese would just be crushed to learn that you weren't actually a star, starstruck 18 year old. Hey, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did meet her subsequently many times because it well, not many, but two or three times because, you know, she'd come in and she was a supporter of the, the venue. Um, and she was always very nice when we picked up the conversation. So I would be like, extravagantly surprised if she ever remembered me, obviously. But she certainly, between those meetings, she remembered, oh, that was the guy. So I think someone might have passed along and said, oh, you have to go and talk to Seamus. He's, he's <laughs> just thinks you're marvelous. And I had to go along with it. I had to go along with it because that was my shtick. Now I was like, okay, oh. the small price to pay is I'm the weird 18 year old politics nerd with gland problems. Uh, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's better than being the disgusting uh, drug fiend who came into work with uh, such a powerful person and paragon of the Irish state and uh, could have poisoned her if I <laughs> placed my potions in the wrong order. <laughs> Well, Seamus you, you didn't just come to, to tell us an, an awesome story because in all fairness it's uh, you, you've turned your life around Seamus God uh -huh. bless you you have <laughs> thank you so much and more power to you but you've you've written a fantastic book and it's it's due out in the next couple of days isn't it oh no it's, it's, it's out it's out Tom I can, I, can tell you, I can attest to you that it's out because I have a copy of it right here I'm about three quarters of the way through it it's called uh, Did You Hear Mommy Died and it's absolutely fantastic, Seamus. I got to congratulate you on that. Uh, you, you, you bastard. You uh, <laughs> made me laugh and also cry quite a bit. And I was in holidays, and there was people there, and they looked over <laughs> me like I was a wee bit simple. But uh, uh, even though that was a terrible thing to do to make pride, it was a wonderful thing to do for the book reading public. Yeah, it's been really nice having people send me pictures of it from beaches. That's happened quite a bit. It's like I do think it is very good to read on the beach because. Um, but I'm such a fabulous writer, obviously. Of course. Um, uh, and also, you know, I don't particularly like beaches. So if I see people sunning themselves, I mean, I personally am in the opinion that the sun gets too easy a deal uh, in the world. Oh, it's uh, way. I think anything over, is way over the top. Like. Anything over 20 degrees is just showing off. Not a big fan of the sea either. It's a big stew of, you know, fish and just rubbish. Um, but it's been amazing hearing people's reactions. That's been great. And the fact that it's it's now still number one, I think, after two weeks, which is great. Fantastic. Uh, and extremely unexpected because I, I don't really have a gigantic profile or anything. Also, the book is called Did You Hear Mommy Died, which might seem like a bit of a diner. Um, uh, but no, it's been amazing. And it's been really, uh, it's been really interesting talking about it from the point of view of, of how it was written and you know how my family feel about it and you know the fact that you're talking about stuff which is quite sad but with a lot of humor thrown in as jerry can attest from having a small stroke between crying and laughing <laughs> uh, it was a risk to do so i felt it was a risk the entire time i was writing it and i didn't know if it was going to land or if people were going to enjoy it but um Thankfully, they have at least well, they've at least been buying it. So, really? um, <laughs> if they, so even if you don't like it, just don't tell me. But keep just buy another copy. <clears throat> to the audio listeners, Seamus is two fingers up to you all actually at the moment. But <laughs> he's got your money now, so hey. 
Yeah, and you may notice that I've got gold rings on every finger. Every finger, like that potion seller. Has, he's like, basically, if you see Seamus in the street, stop, because he definitely has some info for you to move on to the next level. He's, uh... <laughs> yeah, or like that really irrelevant information you get. It's like, I hear the king is a new advisor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay, cool. Thanks for... I, uh, yeah, and keep yeah. repeating it. Keep yeah. repeating it. Oh, I don't. I think you'll find that he's from Greymoor. <laughs> and then you have to go through the you have to go through the the, the branch branches. And it's like, uh, what is Greymoor? Tell me what this. Or like, fuck off. Uh, <laughs> I just want a rum and coke, not a red wine. Tell me more about this Lafayette choir. <laughs> oh, the Guinean drummers. I honestly, it, it that was the best. What out of the best story. Hands down. <laughs> That's it. Of all, all the worst that's gigs. A, that, that, that's and we've my had worst people, gig ever, Hall of Fame, right there. We've had people tell us about the time they shit themselves on stage in front of 12,000 people. Jesus Christ. No, still a better told story. Yes. Kit and the, pre- and the president. That should be the name of your next I would, I, I, I would say I would say all these stories are are, are, are good in their own ways with that. Like, oh, you know, listen to- I would say, uh, political McBride down here. Oh, political McBride. Great, huh? I will take. I'll, I'll take. I'll take. Uh, I'll take bean on ketamine with a glass full of, with a handful of glasses over shitting myself. Though I will say that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I. I. Yeah. That's. It's always that thing. You know, when you have like the stress dreams recurring dreams. A lot of people say it's like, uh, you you stand. You're on stage and you're naked, or you have to do your, your leaving exams and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I have the one. All my teeth fall out. Definitely. But I think any, public defecation which thankfully has never happened to me in my life that it's yeah that's um how how do you how do you get out of that because you i mean your, your man you your man in the star is born kills himself i mean spoiler, spoiler alert for star is born but. yeah listen you just have to be you know strong really good looking and a fucking showman and get on with the fucking show you got 12 songs to sing and have your bandmates hose you down afterwards like a cow <laughs> blame, blame the blame the blame the keyboard player and plow on and just um, just legislate for afterwards by always tucking your trousers into your socks yeah yeah, yeah. Be done. or get that gimp suit that that guy had under the urinal that time you were telling us about that's what he was doing <laughs> that's what he was doing that's what he was doing Seamus, thank you very much for coming along uh, at Shockproof Beats on Twitter for anybody who doesn't follow you, although I'm pretty sure anybody that's listening to us does. And did you hear Mammy Died in all good bookshops and I dare say some shit ones too. Thanks a million, Seamus. Oh, thanks so much. I hooked her on, a car jagail. Oh my God, that's a story, isn't it? Holy shit, Tom. I mean... I, I'm, I'm going to say very little else about it Tom because what more can be said and a hundred uh, thank yous to Seamus O'Reilly for giving us his time to appear on the Tom and Jerry podcast uh, needless to say buy the book did you hear Mommy Died it's absolutely fantastic but you probably fucking knew all that already because you follow Seamus on Twitter if you don't already he's at Shockproof Beats uh, I don't need to tell people that. I feel fucking stupid Tom no. it's like hey you know what it's like next, next time you're in a pub try a Guinness you fucking know all this already you're following him it's- <laughs> you've bought his book it's standard practice to say it, and it's a polite thing to do, but the reality is the majority of people will already be following him. majority of people would have probably known about that story, but there's nothing more. And we got a little bit of spice at the top just to tee it up, which was nice. A little bit of spice oh, at the top in, oh, the, yeah. in that restaurant DJ said where he completely had lost, lost his marbles for an hour. Yeah. Nice, nice, just nice. to tee us up. It was a fantastically Wonderful. well-constructed. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Seamus. Jerry, before we hit the road, we'll tell people uh, what we need to tell them. We are, of course, in the midst of yeah. season six, which, as you will tell, thank uh, thank you all very much for some class comments. It's class, it's brilliant, much, absolutely lovely, great stuff. Bunch of lovely comments coming in. You can and, tell. Me and f- to that, I say, you know, Tom, that's for our episode one, which is part one of the Fred Dibna story. Lads, stick around for Monday for episode two, the second half of the Fred Dibna story, where shit starts to fall down. Now you're talking, and it is an absolute fucking pleasure to talk I could talk about that man all day so turn around have a look back if you're brand new to the Tom and Jerry show have a guess how many other seasons there are given that we're in the midst of season 6 yeah 5 other seasons go have a gander hit subscribe loads of good stuff there's a new one gonna pop into your into your inbox whatever app you listen to on whether it's Apple Spreaker you know Spotify everybody's listening to Spotify nowadays if that's your thing go ahead yeah 
Moment. Before uh, we, we do recommend, uh, we do recommend, uh, we do recommend subscribing to the podcast so you never have to worry about it. But if you're one of these guys that plays it fast and loose and likes to live life on the edge and just wants to go hunting down these podcasts without them being handed to you, then what you should probably do is follow us on social media at Tom and Jerry Show. We'll get us on Twitter and I dare say on Instagram as well. And uh, you will see links appearing for the episodes as and when they drop, as the kids say. Exactly. Uh, that being said, before we head out the gap, if you do uh, have found yourself becoming a, a fan of the Tom and Jerry show, please rate and share. Rate it, give it the five stars. And less than that is no use to us. We have a five star clean record. People have been absolutely classed nice. with five star clean record. We'd like to bump up the amount of five stars. I think you can only do it on one or two. Apple Podcasts is definitely one of them. I wish they'd allow it on more, but if they do allow it on whatever platform you listen to, please do give it five stars. Write us a nice review. It helps other people find it, weirdly enough. The more there reviews it gets, the more it gets pumped up in front of people's eyeballs. Helps more people come to the show. Now, Jerry. And who doesn't like that? Right, Tom. Holy shit, we got to go do a bunch of ketamine uh, with the president. <laughs> I've never done ketamine. I must try it. It's I mean, stuff. like, uh, shit. Seamus, Seamus was selling it there like it was a bad thing, but I was like, you know, I could probably do it slowing down time a wee bit here and there. <laughs> right. Hey, do, on... do, a load of, do a load of ketamine and listen to this podcast. No, okay. no, maybe no. No, okay, no, no, do, no. Do don't do ketamine don't... and go back and listen to this podcast, because by yeah. now they would have already listened to the podcast. But look, anyway, we're not, we're not trying to... Edit that out, Tom. I don't want to be responsible for this. I'm totally not editing that out. Boys and girls... Have a lovely weekend. We'll talk to you again on Monday with a brand new episode, part two of the Fred Dibner story. Mm-hmm.